piece of writing about the aftermath of the war, thanks, in um, the aftermath of the 20th century wars in England and France. So it's one long poem, it's called Aftermath. In Calais they keep their memories in a bunker in the middle of a park. It's hard to know which came first, the bunker or the park. The bunker, a concrete squat built above ground, entered in single file past a roped off machine gun. Or the park, tidy lawns, concentric circles, scattered bodies of homeless migrants asleep on the grass. It means memories, not memories themselves, you understand, but remembering this smell of damp, this discipline of single file, the sense that light is running out, the sense that you are bound to queue for the chance to leave. In Switzerland, they built enough bunkers during the war to house the whole population. Single story, built above ground, and camouflaged with iron fir trees to look like forests, painted lines to look like boulders, concrete curls to look like a traditional Swiss chalet perched alone on the strategic side of a mountain. Over the years, the iron fir tree rusts green and russet like its imagination. Come to visit the bunker and approach in single file. Here you can buy a replica bullet, not live, and stare at photocopied photographs of men in tuxedos, women with stern jaws, and doe-eyed children whose pictures were taken before war began, before this particular war began, and before anyone knew, of course, of the need for resistance. In Calais, they keep quiet about the Eurostar, which is 20 years old this year. There was a ceremony on a boat, says Jan. That's a strange place to hold a ceremony for an underground train, I say. And he shrugs, this man, Jan, who has been in Tel Aviv and Berlin and recently in Dieppe, where he boarded a plane and reimagined the first flight across the English Channel. If a chalet offers protection, then what is the need for a bunker, you say, to no one? What will the soldiers think, with their wide eyes, their rose lips and their paddle hands, you ask, to no one? As there is no one there with you in the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Calais, where you find this information, or where you are accompanied only by a troop of hollow black blocks, the life beaten into them by the treatment that must be awarded to bones and backs and bellies. He tells me this, this placeless man, Jan, and I wonder where he is from. It would be rude to ask, so I nod and I pretend I know about the history of flight and the bunker in which it began. I pretend that looking at his placeless features is bound to tell me something. In Calais, they keep their mannequins in perspex boxes and they furnish them with the same feline faces, the same painted eyelashes, the same rose-kissed lips, the same jaunty hips, the same moulded hands raised slightly as if they might greet you with their drawn-on fingers. A replica man, not live, in the uniform of an English soldier, in the uniform of a French soldier, in the uniform of a German soldier. They should be England's problem, says the mayor. The migrants do not belong to Calais, and this is some five years after she staged the great publicity stunt, the ceremonial destruction of the detention centre known as the jungle. Replica bodies, fairly loud, do not mention the past, do not mention the future, everything is unspeakable. In Calais they keep their memories in a bunker, under the guard of a roped off machine gun, a vitrine of look-alike bullets, and a collection of mannequins, who keep watch with the same interchangeable heads, whether they represent the painted hair of England, the long eyelashes of France, or the cat bones of Germany. This means memories, not memories themselves, you understand, but the fact that we remember, remember. It is the insignia on a mannequin's lapel that lets you know whether he will raise his drawn-on fingers to shake your hand or whether something else is bound to happen. In Calais, they keep their memories in a bunker in the middle of a park and they keep their butcher's blocks in the Musée des Beaux-Arts, scores of years of pounding fists and knives, scoring cuts and bones and backs and bellies. On the first floor of the art gallery, people smile quietly. 
as if, indeed, there is anyone there. The windows are blind to the park. A gravestone masquerades as a speech bubble. The aviators built a bunker in Calais, he says. The innovators, the imagineers. This is some 50 years before the other ones appeared. The adventurers built a bunker for their plane to escape from. They staged a photo shoot with cigars wedged between their freezing fingers. In Calais, they keep their butcher's blocks in the art gallery and they keep their migrants in the park, on street corners and on benches looking out to sea and to the great colossal ferries that roll in and out, gasping to each other in the breathless bovine songs of the ocean. Come to visit the imprint of bodies, but do not touch this parade of tactile stone, pounded by years and painted black, matte black, the kind of black that draws the light out of a room and makes it impossible to notice a detail, like the insignia on a mannequin's lapel or the question in a stranger's wide brown eyes. And years later, the first bunker was repurposed, says Jan, as a kind of prison. They called it the jungle. Yes, that is a racist term. Here you can buy a replica bullet, not live, and stare at photocopied photographs of men in tuxedos, women with stone jaws, and doe-eyed children whose pictures were taken before war began, before this particular war began, and before anyone knew, of course, of the need for repetition. Maybe, you say, the Swiss bunkers were built like chalets to entice people in, you say, to no one, as you illegally slide a finger down the skin sore scores of a matte black butcher's block. Camouflage for our friends, not our enemies, whoever we might be, it is bound to be one or the other. How can it not be, I say to Jan, who shrugs, because he knows all this. He is a man of the world, a placeless man, an interchangeable man. It would be rude to ask, so I say nothing but scoop a finger around the inside of a hot chocolate cup and remember the two men with wide dark eyes staring, dead still, at the great beasts on the horizon, as if indeed there is anyone there. <laughs>